that up. Great. Good morning, all. Uh, appreciate folks joining. Uh, uh, my better half, Carol, is on a Getty Zoom, so she'll be joining us later. Uh, but uh, today we're going to look at uh, some 16 millimeter films of uh, various odds and ends. Uh, talked in a, a number of past talks about uh, you know the challenges dealing with eight millimeter that is such a tiny, tiny little thing, and then super eight's a little bit better. And uh, at 16, the differences can be breathtaking. Um, I recently upgraded the scanner, mentioned that uh, there were a whole bunch of challenges with that, which I am still working through. Uh, but it's it's uh, I think you'll see some of the results have come out pretty good. And what's interesting is you think you have a process to work on it. The way uh, the whole process should work is you scan it on, on the scanner and it creates uh, a file for every, uh, every image. It creates a, a still file, which then it combines into a movie. So 16 millimeter film is generally shot at 24 frames a second. So for every second you take a film, you end up with 24 uh, images. And then you can take that into, you know, how many images per minute, how many images per hour. It gets to be a, a massive number. You take that film uh, out and it's it's a raw film uh, that sees it just as the scanner does. And this new scanner edition, by the way, has a very nice uh, white balance adjustment on it. So it, it does a lot better getting films looking the way it should, as opposed to the other light source and the other one, which was a little uh, wonky, shall we say. So I take that out and I put it into a, a, a package called Film 9, which I've mentioned before, it takes a little jitter, you know, even at 16 millimeter, the, you know, the camera moves or the, the frame moves a little and you'll see like a trash can sitting there and we'll go back and forth. Well, you put it in film nine, it will stabilize it. Well, I found out some of the 16 millimeter film is not necessarily shot at uh, 24 frames per second. You could also shoot 16 millimeter at 16 frames per second. So if you put it in the film nine, it's expecting uh, to have uh, uh, 24 frames per second and you put it in at 16, everybody's running around like the Keystone cop. So uh, you mm -hmm. got to find out what it was, reset it. Then I take it and I put it into a, Adobe, uh, uh, no, in this particular case, Pinnacle Studio 26. And I use that to put the titles in, cut out the bad splices and uh, all that sort of odds and ends. And uh, that puts out a, 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 a film which I then have been taking into a Topaz video and upscaling that to 60 frames per second. Uh, what I, oh, here's Carol joining us, let her in. Uh, what I found was that, and I, I did a whole bunch of these the other day, frantically working to get them ready for today. And I found out that uh, sometimes the uh, pinnacle would put things out at the right aspect ratio and other times it would squeeze it a little. and even though if you say use what I did the last time, it was still resetting itself. So just ending it up, we're gonna see some things that are looking really good, some things that are a little squeezed. Uh, I, I, I don't think we'll be seeing the Keystone Cops version of anything, but uh, I'm gonna start with uh, uh, Disneyland in uh, an unknown year. That That's one of the challenges. Sometimes you get these and you look for a sign, you know, if it says the, uh, you know, Puff and Bake Shop, you can put it within certain years, Yale, uh, locks a certain year <laughs> when you have the columbia going by the uh you know tom sawyer island it's really hard to uh to place it but let me get ready to share screen and share sound optimize for video here we go vlc media player so this should be the first one The monster is in its dry dock, which we'll see uh, the gates of the dry dock in a little while. Well, late 70s later. Yeah, that
look behind the Mark Twain, there's the uh, gates of the dry dock. That one was, uh, you know, it, it was really nice. The the colors on that held up really well, so I had to do next to no color correction on it, except for when he went into the country bear jamboree, because uh, with a lot of film, uh, sometimes you have indoor settings and outdoor settings. So he shot the little kind of uh, bit of the country bears he shot with outdoor settings. So when you go in and you've got all the tungsten based lighting, the whole thing was just blown out. So uh, I had to scan it and then uh, uh, rescan it with the color corrections redone for that, put the two of them together. Also, every time he went from one scene to another scene, there were two to three frames that were, uh, you know, just pop out very bright and then it would uh, get back down. So uh, that's where the editing becomes, uh, you know, a, a bit of a challenge because you look at it and you're watching it. For me, it drives me crazy. I'm watching something that goes pop, pop, pop. So I just went and, and took them all out. But the number of times I've had to redo that footage as I'm fighting the damn software and the scanner is it's, it's drives you crazy. So, uh, uh, but it, it, again, you know, it's the '70s. Yeah, the country bear jamborees there. You can see the, uh, you know, as the boat went by the the bear hall. But uh, trying to narrow it down, even with you know trying to get to uh, views of people's clothing, you know, clothing or anything is is tough. There was in in New Orleans Square. There was what looked like a couple of buses parked out there. Did you see what I? What was that? It's it, something weird was in New Orleans Square when they shot from Tom, Tom Sawyer Island. They shot back over New Orleans Square. It looked like a couple of buses or food carts or something. I don't know what they were. But. Oh, well, we could take a look at that again. Hang on one second. Yeah, I think that was actually in the, uh, I mean, the Frontierland section just to yeah. the left of. You know of what I'm I, noticed, about? I noticed the same thing. Yeah, it looked like there was a couple of uh, people had pulled their uh, uh, campers in. Yeah, it was weird. It's not something you normally find in, in a theme world like this. Further beyond the bears. I can't see it from here, but we're going to hear. It was obviously before they built the big stage out there, Bill. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. No fantastic. fantastic. Good. Like I said, this film held up very, very well. Okay, so here we go. Yeah, look there. Yeah. Uh, see? Oh no, you know what that, that is? Umbrella. That's the awning. That's the umbrella. Oh. The awning over where they did used to do the the pancake bread. Or they probably still do, but there was wasn't it Aunt Jemima that originally um, sponsored that. Yeah, it's and it's some restaurants. It's just that the the way it stuck out, it looked like the front of a Winnebago or something. But you're right. That's just the awning on a building. Yeah, I thought the same thing, and then watching it the second time, it was like, oh, no, I know where that is now. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how uh, things will do that. So let me uh, just come down here and get another film. Now, this next one was kind of interesting, trying to date the, the years on this one. Um, let me get this going. Real quick, we start with the old uh, Tomorrowland, so uh, the old Astro Jets and everything else, and then you try to figure out when this was done. Uh, it has to be uh, sometime in '66 or early '67 because they redid Tomorrowland in '67. So we're going to see, uh, you know, the newer Skyway buckets, uh, you know, and, and you try to date what year they went in, uh, that that sort of thing. So uh, we're getting one of the last views of Tomorrowland before it was uh, gone. I should have cleaned his camera a little. And look, swimming mermaids. I got the mermaids, yeah. They were early 60s to late 60s, I think. The small world went in 66. as a dot. Small World went in 66 and New Tomorrowland, I believe, opened in 67 or 68. You got a pretty tight window there. Yeah. So we're going to hop over to a real quickie one of Knott's Berry Farm that was uh, in here.
what was uh what was interesting for me on that was that came on a a, a roll of film was about 600 feet long of uh, the guy's western vacation and lots of footage of uh driving down empty roads uh a, a whole bunch of footage of uh, bears at yellowstone but if you you went to disneyland and to knott's berry farm would that have been the entire amount of footage any one of us would have taken? You know, <laughs> I mean, footage of, you know, again, the, the whole film runs maybe 12 minutes or something, but, you know, and you're going and it's like, okay, we're six minutes of us driving down the highway. And he's not even looking at like great signs or anything. It's just, you know, like on the road again, it, it just it really struck me as, you know, Priorities. I mean, I, I'd rather have pictures of my kids at Disneyland with Mickey Mouse than pictures of, you know, Interstate 15 or whatever. So, how far away was uh, Knott's Berry Farm from Disneyland? Uh, it's about, uh, uh, what, eight miles, something like that. Uh, yeah, Brock's nodding. It's it's not very far at all. It's it's uh, two exits, three exits up on the, uh, the Interstate 5. So, you get off at Beach Boulevard, continue down three, four exits, whatever. You know, get off uh, for Disneyland. They're very close. I presume built after Disneyland. No, uh, Knott's Berry Farm actually started uh, uh, first. That uh, basically, Knott's uh, the whole story there was he had a uh, uh, again a berry farm, and uh, his wife started uh, selling chicken dinners uh, to to make money for it. Uh, let me let Leslie in here, and. Uh, the chicken dinners became very, very popular. They had a little roadside stand there. So they uh, they built a restaurant uh, and the lines became so long that he built uh, what he called Ghost Town. He went off and bought uh, actual buildings from old ghost towns around the uh, the West, brought them there and put them in. And uh, you, know, you could wander through Ghost Town for free to uh, entertain yourself uh, waiting for uh, Mrs. Knott's fried chicken. And then it grew and grew and grew, and they finally, uh, you know, had so many people going there. They gated it in, started selling uh, admission, and then later along came the, uh, you know, the, the theme park type rides and that sort of stuff. So, okay. if, if you go there today, a lot of the original ghost town buildings are still there. So uh, it's a real, real walk back in time. He also had another town, uh, Calico, California, which is now a, a state park. And again, you go out there, all sorts of old uh, antique buildings and that sort of stuff. It's 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 kind of kind of a fun place to visit out in the middle of nowhere, as most ghost towns are, right? Okay. Yeah, I've been right. there. So uh, let me go over to Ep uh, Expo sixty seven one second. Okay, uh, Expo sixty seven. Here we go. Oh, wait, hang on a second. I have to share the screen again. One second. I had forgotten I'd come out of it for a moment. Share screen. Okay. So this one starts with some homemade titles. This one was uh, very, very, very badly uh, exposed. I mean, just because it's shot in 16 millimeter doesn't mean that uh, either it was shot right or that the film stock has lasted. So this one went from periods of uh, extreme overexposure to um, uh, extreme underexposure, but uh, still gave us some some nice views. I have another one coming up that has some really nice uh, uh, scenes of uh, Expo, particularly with uh, fireworks. So I've, I will play with this one some more, but this one has about uh, six different filters applied to it. So it takes forever to process because it was uh, basically very overexposed and bright yellow. Again, sometimes the yellow, uh, that sort of thing comes because people use the, uh, you know, the wrong filters on it uh, or decide to use outdoor film for indoor or vice versa, or sometimes it just, uh, you know, fades over time. That's a signboard that blew around in the wind. So they must have been having a little bit of wind there at that particular day. We're outside the Kodak Pavilion. Uh, you got Cuba over on the right, Kodak uh, over on the left, and uh, incredibly long lines for some of these. Uh, Kodak, you went in and they would you know, uh, teach you how to use your camera, that sort of thing. 
uh, but nothing along the uh, scope of what they had in, um, uh, in New York in 64. The USSR pavilion in the back. And again, this is the line people waiting to get inside Cuba over there on, on the right. Cuba was a real big draw because there was all the, uh, you know, the recent stuff of the Cuban Missile Crisis and everything. And the U.S. government was telling people not to go to Cuba to support them. So, of course, that made going to the Cuba uh, that much more interesting to everybody else. It was a very, very political uh, uh, driven uh, displays inside. Still pretty yellow. I'm gonna say next time you're running through your machine, hit that white balance first. Oh, it's been done. Believe me, I, I white balanced it on the uh, the scanner. Uh, really? Yeah. If I showed you what the original of this looked like, uh, it's it's pretty nasty. I, I think I might still have it on the uh, the computer. I can look for it after. All right. Yeah, it's it's like I said, it's. It, you, with old film, you know, considering this is, uh, you know, coming up on close to 60 years, too, you don't know how it was shot. You, uh, you know, the Disneyland footage came out really nice. Uh, you know, it was, uh, like I said, I had to do next to nothing to uh, to clean it up, just a little uh, little color tint adjustment, but uh, nothing major, uh, you know, to it whatsoever. This one is probably no more than, you know, uh, it, it's, it's newer, uh, you know, well, no, it's, it's probably a few years older because the country bears. So this may be five years older than the Disneyland footage, but it's still, uh, you know, it's it's all all a matter how you shoot it. I probably mentioned in past talks we we would lend our family movie camera to my uh, aunt who was a world traveler, and uh, I, I don't know where her movies went. My my, my cousins probably has them. But, uh, you know, my dad would work with her, you know, and telling her how to, you know, get it set for daytime and how to set it for nighttime and everything. And she'd come back and we'd see uh, her, her thumb traveling the world because she could not, <laughs> not to put it in front of the camera. So we joke about Aunt Floss's thumb visiting the Vatican and Aunt Floss's thumb at the bullfights and Aunt Floss's uh, thumb, you know, at Big Ben. So it's, it's all, all in the operator, right? Okay, I'm seeing some shifting of colors there, particularly on the lake, you know, on the waterway. Is, is Do you have it set for automatic color balance or manual color balance to where where it goes from scene to scene, the, the color balance doesn't shift like it was doing in, in the boat on the on the waterway there? It went from like a brown to a very blue back to a – and I'm wondering, if, is your software – automatically setting color balance and adjusting it to the scene? No, the camera does a, a one that's uh, basically global. Uh, although what I'll do then is I'll, I'll try to scan it three, four times, uh, adjusting it for different scenes. Then in the software, I will stop, uh, you know, break it into segments and I will try to color balance the uh, 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 software. Like this particular section right here was incredibly overexposed. Uh, the section before it was very underexposed. So I had to stop this here and, and really dial down the brightness for this particular section. Then when we leave here, it's another edit and uh, it, it's basically trying to do it scene by scene. Where it get, becomes a bit of a challenge is when something pans from a very light area to a dark area or vice versa. And the color is basically shifting as the camera is moving uh, you know, because of the light that was there at, at that point in time. Uh, it's beyond my capabilities of making a, uh, you know, mid-transition graduated color uh, shift. Okay, makes sense, makes sense. Yeah, so some of the times with this stuff, you just have to say, you know, close enough is, uh, is good enough, but... Well, you know, you know, every time I see stuff from Expo 67, I, I just marvel that, you know, uh, five, six, whatever it was, seven years earlier, this was a raging river, you know, that this, these islands were either totally man-made or uh, it expanded. So, uh, you know, it just shows if you really want to get something done, you, you, you can do it. You're right about the islands being expanded. The 
fill that they used to build the islands came from the excavation of the subway system. Yeah, uh, let me just stop this one right real quick right here. Yeah, uh, uh, that's uh, partially true. Not all the fill. Uh, a lot of the fill did come from there, but they also did a lot of dredging uh, of the river bottom and just you know dump it there. But yeah, that was convenient that they, uh, they were building a subway at the same time. Just wanted to point out the little thing sticking up on red there. That was emergency. Uh, if you had a, a problem with Expo, you can see a red box on a, a phone, uh, on a pole there that you could call in. And then they would also make, uh, you know, loud speaker announcements that, uh, you know, Johnny Jones is lost and he's waiting for you at, the, you know, wherever sort of thing. But the, the if I just go back. Uh, what uh, was that building just to the right of the uh, USSR pavilion? This one here? Yeah. Yeah, that's the uh, uh, steel uh, industry pavilion. So, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, it was kind of interesting. Just like Wayne uh, mentions, they had a coal mine at the um, museum in Chicago. Here they had a steel foundry. And uh, outside they had giant bins of uh, all the uh, raw ore and you know stuff that they'd be using. And when you went inside, they had a pretty good recreation re uh, with uh, very authentic smells of uh, how you take uh, you know iron ore and create uh, you know process it into uh, the steel. So. Uh, it was uh, it was interesting. And then in later years, it became the Arms Pavilion and all sorts of other odds and ends. Um, here they had these these were little uh, perimeter lights that went along, uh, so they were not glaring. Earlier, I don't know if we'll show up again. I can't back this up too easily right now. They had some really great uh, street lights at the uh, Expo that are uh, you know very 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 interesting design where the light bounced up off a, a, a reflector disc. So everything was done with soft indirect lighting as opposed to uh, overhead street lights. The little train was called the mini rail and they had uh, several uh, routes that they would take you there. Uh, one across the island, uh, another would take you over to uh, uh, La Ronde, the amusement area. And uh, we're gonna see some nice nighttime footage of, uh, of La Ronde. And you could tour the site on these boats, which were called Vaporettos, uh, based after the boats that take you through uh, Venice. Uh, they also, uh, they were sticking with the Venetian theme. Uh, you'll see a uh, motorized uh, gondola go by. That's Caddy Mavic, uh, and the, uh, the inverted pyramid is a Caddy Mavic, and over to the left is the people tree. So that's looking back at the uh, Canada uh, pavilions. So here comes another one of the boats and uh, we'll see the uh, gondola come along behind it. The building in the back was France that is still there today. It's the uh, casino and you can go in, uh, you know, walk through. I mean, the entire thing's been gutted and changed or anything. And we have a Mountie come by. They did this several times a day. They would just ride up and pose for pictures. Oh, our ever-present nuns. There's the people tree. They took people from all across Canada and took their pictures and put them up in the tree. And if you were underneath it, they had uh, recorded sounds of uh, people, you know, talking about their villages or towns or whatever. And then when it reopened in 1968, they had to take all those pe people's pictures down because they had all of them signed a contract to be on display for 1967, not thinking that they would be in 1968. So in 68, it was just colored uh, cloth panels. There's a gondola. Guy had it easy, he didn't have to pull his way through it. Giant blocks of granite over there. When they had nice wide open walkways, I, I never felt that uh, any sense of being crowded or anything. They had some pretty uh, good days in terms of uh, crowd capacity. Uh, you know, you, you look at the attendance numbers, uh, they, they did pretty well. Um, they met their attendance goals uh, and exceeded them for uh, Montreal, which is why they uh, felt encouraged to go ahead with the uh, uh, Man of This World the, the later years.
and looking across to the city, which uh, it has changed quite dramatically since then, as you can imagine, quite a few more um, uh, skyscrapers and stuff. When we get later in the day, the sun's starting to go down, so the lights are changing color a bit. But there's Thailand brought there from uh, New York and expanded for uh, for Montreal. We're riding aboard one of the mini uh, trains right now. Looking across at the USA Pavilion, you can see uh, spaceships hanging there and other odds and ends. This is the Expo Express, an automated train, first uh, computerized train in the Northern uh, Hemisphere and uh, taking people over from uh, 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 the one entrance area onto the main island. And there's the controls uh, real quick of the uh, uh, mini rail. Now we're at, at La Ronde, which is still there today. And some of the original uh, rides are still there, but they've added a whole bunch of uh, new ones. This is the carousel, which was at the Belgian village for the 64 fair and brought over uh, for, uh, for Expo. We're going to have some calliope music or something. Hey, hold on. I'm noticing that on these dark scenes, the, the uh, darker is nice and flat, not like your old light source. Yeah, it, it, it's much more balanced. That one had, uh, I think, seven uh, LEDs and a, a circular array. This one uses 81 and a, a square array. So a nine by nine matrix so it comes out uh, a lot nicer. I was comparing some films that were shot on uh, one unit to the other and uh, uh, I was very pleased. And the other one, this would have been all blown out. You wouldn't have been able to read uh, you know, any of this stuff. So looking across at the USSR pavilion. And then we have to return the favor by looking across at the USA Pavilion, which shooting across uh, the water at night, you'll see it didn't, uh, didn't give us much. So there's the USA train passing in front of it. Thailand at night. We're going to get into some fireworks so we can ooh and ah is mandatory at fireworks shows. Every night, just like the 64 fair, they had a fireworks show at uh, Montreal. And some ground displays spinning around. And I think we have one last hurrah in the sky.
Okay, let me just find something else here real quick. Um, let's see, I'm going to... Uh, Bill, while you're getting the other film up, I, the reason I'd asked about that one building, the steel building, it yes. was, I wonder if it was the same architect that did the chapel at the U.S. Air Force Academy. Uh, you know, if you've ever seen that building, it looks very, very similar in its the way it's folded and the whole thing about it. Yeah, yeah. You're right about that. Yeah. I could see a, a resemblance there. Hang on one second here. We're just trying to look for something else real quick. That building's in Boulder, Colorado, I believe. Yeah. The Air Force Academy? No, the Air Force Academy yeah. is North Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs, yeah. Because yeah. I've been there. You do lots of times. <laughs> Boulder's well, up north of Denver and Colorado Springs is south of Denver. Yeah, 60 miles. All right, hang on. I'm, where did I put where I wanted to show? Ah, I know. I'm looking in the wrong folder. You know, if you look in some place and it's not where you, you want it to be. So uh, just to give me an idea of what I'm, uh, let me cue this one up here. Um, and share screen. I just did this one real quick as an a, example of the uh, difference between the uh, uh, old scanner and the uh, the new one. Um, just to, the on the left is the uh, uh, new scanner. On the uh, right is the uh, old scanner. So let me just uh, play this here, just to give an idea. For one thing, it gives a larger image area of the uh, uh, what you call it, the the film. You you capture more of it, but you can also see, for example, the difference here. And these mm -hmm. were both set on the default settings. So you can see here, the, the one building here is uh, visible. Over here, it's just blown out. Uh, we actually do get blue sky as opposed to pink sky. Um, so the uh, uh, it does make a difference. Now you have to then take what this is doing and uh, play with it more and adjust it more. But there's a scene uh, coming up here, for example, of the mini rail going by. And again, you can see uh, much bluer, you know, uh, uh, there and uh, as, as opposed to here. So I'm happy with what I'm getting out of it. It's just, uh, you know, uh, becoming a, uh, oh, shall we say, a, a learning curve. <laughs> you know, it, it's like when they take the training wheels off the, the bicycle. So, but it's it's getting there. So I had uh, another film I wanted to share. Let's see where to go. Let me search. Okay. Whoops, hit the wrong button. This is a 1940s film. Let me just uh, pause it real quick. 1940s film, if anybody can identify the actual cars or nail it down, there's a, a picture of some license plates that are uh, not immediately uh, visible. Uh, this is, uh, hang on, I got a slightly color corrected version of this one. Let me just find out where it went. Okay, here we go. So Lechworth State Park, if you're not familiar with this, upstate New York, uh, sort of in the, going towards the Buffalo area. Uh, my brother Jerry, who lives upstate now, is actually going to Letchworth to see the eclipse on uh, uh, Monday because it's supposed to go right over Letchworth. But Letchworth is a it's a really great spot. Uh, as you can see, it's called the Grand Canyon of the East. I think every state has its own Grand Canyon. But uh, I love going there. With I first went there, I think it was about maybe ten years old or so with my grandparents. Uh, been there a number of times, and and in Past years, it would be really, really crowded because it was cooler than uh, you know New York uh, City was and everything. Now you go up there, it's it's nowhere near as busy as it used to be. But if you're upstate, it, uh, it it's uh, it's it's a pretty area. I really recommend. The Genesee River th uh, flows through it, and uh, uh, Letchworth has three uh, main waterfalls, a whole bunch of minor ones, but they have the cleverly named Upper, Middle, and uh, Lower Falls. So we're up on the fall foliage uh, drive up there. Uh, I'll pay the 50 cents. We can all go in for free. 
So again, you know, attempt tantalizing to try to read the exact date on the license plate. I have not been able to get it. I may try to take a still image off of it and try to blow it up. But if anybody knows cars and can tell us what we're looking at, that would be great. Colorado's place looks like it's New York State. It is a New York State plate, yeah. This bridge is really amazing. They just replaced this bridge within the last three, four years. This is over the upper part of the falls. Uh, built in the 1800s, and um, I, I tell you, every time I would go back there and watch a train go across, particularly in its later years when I got to be, you know, 100 years old, you say, uh, I wonder how the engineer felt when he drove his, uh, you know, heavily laden train uh, across that bridge. Uh, it would kind of uh, groan and make noises and everything, so they finally decided that it, it's a very active rail line, so they, they took it, uh, they didn't take it down, they put another new one up rerouted the train traffic on it, and then finally took the old one down. But this is looking down near the upper falls. The Genesee River uh, may be famous for people who uh, have Genesee beer, which is uh, one of the few beers I found I do not like. Maybe it's because I've seen the, the state of the Genesee River as it flows through Rochester, New York. It, uh, I got there and it was it was green and it wasn't St. Patrick's Day and uh, I decided I was there for an interview with uh, Kodak. I decided I did not want to work uh, in in Rochester, but there is that bridge. Color on this one is superb. Was there much restoration on your part? No, next to none. Or uh, this really really held up uh, exceedingly well. Um, you know, some areas, uh, you're going to see some rainbows coming out that are the guy captured are just really spectacular. So uh, this was a reel I had bought a number of years ago, and I didn't have the capability of doing uh, uh, 16. So I, I, I got this. After he shot this, we then go to New York for a trip to the uh, Statue of Liberty. And, uh, you know, again, the, the, they held up very, very well on it. So um, this is Kodachrome stock. I did look at it. And uh, oh, you have to watch here, the mother in red, when uh, the kids start running and everything, oh no, she doesn't want the kid going in that waterfall. I mean, her, her mama bear reaction kicks in real quick. And then the kids want to see more, so uh, she'll let them see more. But, but you're talking about the, the, you know, the, the, the grip of, vice grip of death there. She's not going to let that kid go over the edge. Isn't that great what he caught? I have to admit, I'm a sucker for waterfalls. Carol and I are going back to New York in July. And uh, I was saying as we were in the car yesterday, you know, I want to get upstate uh, to, uh, uh, you know, go visit some. My brother lives in the, the Ithaca area right now, and they seem to have more waterfalls there than uh, uh, any place else. So I'm looking forward to it. That bridge construction looks um, somewhat similar to the Kinsua Bridge in Pennsylvania, which uh, did collapse. In fact, uh, it collapsed just a couple of weeks before I uh, went on vacation to ride the Kinsua Tourist Railroad. And uh, so the train could, uh, had to stop at the approach, but they uh, let you walk out on the remaining part of the bridge at your own risk. Yeah, I've seen the pictures where you can go and look at the mangled wreckage down in the valley below. They said it was a tornado or something took it out. So we're going to finish with the upper falls and we go to the middle falls in a moment. 
if you go to my uh, website, uh, you know, BillCotter.com, I have a thing about work, you know, places I've been, things I've seen. And this uh, uh, section, I have a, a thing there on uh, Letchworth uh, State Park. Um, looking up there is the, the Middle Falls. We went there with my uh, uh, brother and my uh, my cousin Bob, and uh, we stayed in cabins there. And we had we're having a a, a great time. And uh, my grandfather was doing something else, and he came by and asked what we were being so industrious with. We had laid I, I think it was popcorn or candy or something. We laid a trail of uh, this stuff out, and we were uh, getting very close to getting a raccoon to come into our room because we thought it would be great to have a pet raccoon. My grandfather was not amused at the thought of having a, 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 a raccoon in our uh, motel room. And it was one of the few times I, I saw him get uh, frustrated or lose his, he didn't really lose his temper. He got very irritated, uh, you know, and to us, 10 years old, having a pet raccoon sounded like a good idea. Uh, Letchworth State Park named after a guy named Letchworth and he had uh, made a bunch of money and uh, decided that uh, since you can't take it with you, he would donate it to the uh, New York State Park system. And uh, uh, it, like I said, it, um, you know, I, I don't make money sending people to Letchworth, but uh, if you do get a chance to go, it's uh, it, it is a uh, it, it's pretty spectacular. Uh, and if you can go and fall like these people did, and the trees are turning color, it can be really uh, really breathtaking. So the lower falls are the smaller set of falls. Uh, they have a very nice little stone bridge just in the center of the screen there that you can go out. You can also uh, do what I did, which is on my website. Go past the chain that says no visitors past here to climb up a hill to get a you know picture. The things you do, I think I was 17, 18 when I did that. You know, of course today I'd be horrified and yelling, you know, kids get off my lawn. But you know, uh, the 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 things you do and the memories you can pictures invoke. A little bridge. A lot of this stuff was built during the uh, work project uh, administration, the depression days to give people uh, work and, uh, you know, worked out well. They got jobs and the, the park system got a nice trail system out of it. Has anybody else besides me and Carol been to Letchworth? The closest thing uh, was the Finger Lakes. For okay. us yeah you're not too far from it if you're in yeah. the finger lakes yeah yeah uh, beautiful beautiful yeah there's a couple of pretty areas upstate you know we went to a uh, uh watkins glen is another nice gorge to walk through oh, okay now we're just have some dead footage until we go to new york this is all stuff i'll edit out later on uh last year we did our sable chasm over in the uh, adirondacks uh on so here we are in New York, going to go to the Statue of Liberty. The boats go out several times a day. What's interesting is you look at the footage here and uh, New York Harbor is just so busy with, uh, you know, all the different boats going back and forth, uh, you know, railroad uh, cars on barges, all sorts of things. And here's where you buy your tickets to go out to uh, visit the, the, the statue. I wanted to try to find out when this boat ran, but if you try to look for a boat with the word Liberty in it that goes out <laughs> to the Statue of Liberty, you know, <laughs> good luck. The Red Dome building or aspired building back there is a firehouse for the fire boats for Manhattan. My uh, college roommate's father was stationed there for a while, so it was kind of neat to get to go out on a fire boat. This uh, fort here is called the Battery, and that was a, a Revolutionary War fort to protect the, uh, the area. It's still there. It later became an aquarium, 
It was also used for uh, immigration uh, purposes and has now been restored to its fort configuration as a historical area. But if you ever hear people in the song, the Bronx is up and the battery's down, that's uh, the battery. The question pops into my head uh, as to whether the statue was uh, green like that when it was first uh, installed or uh, if that developed later. No, I don't believe it was. I think the patina built up over the years, you know, as, as copper will do. I believe it was brown when it was first put in. Isn't there isn't there a sample in the museum of it, like her foot or something like that? And it is like what you're saying, it's the original copper brown. Yeah, it's been a while since I've been there. My parents, when they went there, could actually go up and you could climb up to the torch, you know, and uh, the, they decided the arm was getting weak, so they turned it off, uh, the, the access to that off. Mm -hmm. Did you see the pictures of the lightning strike on the statue this week from New York? No. Did it get hit? Oh, yeah. And it was quite spectacular. It was like a double bolt coming into the thing. Wow. They yeah, that's an news. amazing photo. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah, what I visited, uh, the arm was closed. And I think that was uh, in 66. I mean, 65, and uh, you could go to the crown, but not up the arm. Yeah, I was trying to figure out this guy here. He reminds me of Broderick Crawford. Because it looks like he starts signing autographs for people. See, they bring in, would you sign that? So anybody else, uh, Broderick Crawford? It, yeah, it is Broderick Crawford. Yeah, I was going to say, it sure looks like him. It is him. Yeah. If you if you go back two or three frames, you can see it in his nose. Yeah, it's it's definitely Broderick Crawford. Okay, I I thought it was. Yeah, you know. yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, that's definitely him. Yeah, because the kid's running out, give me your autograph. So uh, you know, so we can you know try to figure out you know if anybody's a Broderick Crawford fan, they can t tell us uh, how old he was when this was done. Uh, well. Before highway patrol. Uh, I've do, been doing a little research. I haven't been able to completely do it. I have to see the picture again. But I think that car, the second car that went around the big curve in the road, mm -hmm. that was a, either a Pontiac or an Oldsmobile. And it looked to be an early 50s. Okay. Um, but I need to see it again to kind of get uh, a, another vision in my head of what, what I saw there. Sure, we can oblige you. Yeah, and he looks a little bit younger than he does in Highway Patrol. When he was doing Highway Patrol, he he, he was starting to age a little bit. A little bit, yeah. yeah. Of course, you know, you can watch it every morning at 5 a.m. on MeTV, which I do a lot. This is pretty much the way it was shot without color correction. I haven't uh, done this particular reel but uh, for color yet. But uh, again, it held up uh, pretty well for you know, for the years. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Ferries at the Staten Island. Okay, so let's see if we can find a car here. This one? No, 
the uh after this series this car here there's another um that looks like it could be an older pontiac uh late 40s maybe but the other one there's another shot of one going around a curve that comes up oh i know i remember. just a couple minute 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 or so here that kind of looks like a plymouth for late 40s maybe I think it comes up in just a moment. My uncle, uh, Ray Brooks, was the vice president of Pontiac. Mm. Get a free... Oh, here we go. Yeah, he, <laughs> he took care of his brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, was, there was a shot, or maybe it was... Keep it going here. Maybe after... What I noticed was those ovals on the side. That's why I think they're right there. Mm -hmm. uh, those ovals. And that's, and I say, either a Pontiac or an Oldsmobile, and it's got to be early 50s. I'll have to look at you know some more pictures to see the taillight configuration there. Yeah, uh, anything can pick up. Uh, yeah, be yeah. love to find out. Well, when I see things like that on the side, I think of the... Uh... Buick port holes. Well, that may have been Buick. Yeah, it could have been. I didn't look at Buick. I looked at Oldsmobile and Pontiac, and I wasn't seeing the port holes. And I knew those were on a General Motors car. But you're right; it may be the Pontiac, but it's oh, still in Buick. that same range. I mean, He's in Buick. Buick. Sorry, Buick. Yeah, yeah, the Buick. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, and 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 that would put it though, like say that should be like 52, 53, maybe 51, somewhere in that area, based on the looking at the the styling of it so that gives you a rough idea of where your film was taken or when i'm also going to take the uh like i said the thing creates a zillion still images i'm going to see if i can take some of the still images and put them into like topaz ai or something on some of the license plates and see if i can uh you know get the get the years off the plate yeah so, in my spare time <laughs> So anyway, that was some fun with uh, 16 millimeter, and uh, uh, I, uh, you know, it, it, it takes about uh, maybe 10 minutes or so to uh, change the scanner from uh, 8 millimeter to 16 millimeter. So I tended to have a whole bunch of, uh, you know, uh, 16 stuff stacked up, and I've got one which I really want to get done. It's here. This is the film of the uh, uh, gas energy pavilion uh, at the uh, 82 World's Fair. And it turns out I can handle a seven inch reel and this is a nine and a quarter inch reel. So I have to go find one of my scanner buddies that can uh, do it. But it's a, a 16 millimeter sound film that was uh, shown at the uh, 82 fair. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to getting that uh, redone. So uh, 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 there's always something to, to be done, but uh, again, uh, you know, appreciate folks looking at it. Uh, it it's, it's fun to me to, to go and do this and, you know, Spend my time doing this and not thinking about other other crap. So it's it, I appreciate having uh, you folks to be able to share it with. Uh, you know, Carol's very patient, uh, looking at the back of my head for hours on end as I <laughs> all this stuff. So it uh, it's probably a better view for her anyway. So what the hell? Uh, next week. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, uh, Carol has just had a birthday this week, so we all need to uh, get Carol a happy birthday. Hey, happy, happy birthday. birthday. Happy it was, birthday! It was, it, was, it was my birthday yesterday. Oh wow! Okay. Happy yeah. birthday! Hey, Carol and I, hey, happy birthday. Carol Actually, and I, I share. Mine is on the nineteenth of the month, coming up two weeks from Friday. Okay. Rob, I saw your birthday on the calendar for the luncheon that's coming up for this month, and oh, I yeah. forgot what date it was, but I knew it was in April. Yeah, April fifth. Yours was what the third? April third. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a big, uh, big month for us. We had, uh, Carol's birthday, and then uh, the uh, seventh anniversary of the day we got our dog Misty, and then Monday's Neil's birthday. So <laughs> it's just party central around here. 
Oh, Richard is uh, joining us uh, just in time to say goodbye. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, next week uh, will not be here. Uh, next week's an LAPD event uh, for uh, the Chestworth Street Fair uh, Festival, so I won't be here. And then two weeks from now, I'll be speaking in Anaheim at the uh, Disneyland uh, Alumni Club. So uh, get two weeks off, and uh, uh, then I'll, I'm by sure by then I'll caught up with more stuff. I'm just about uh, you know figured out my mechanical processes of what settings and which video and whatever to do. So I'll get I'll get it there. By the way, Beth, I'm surprised you're here. You know, it's your big event that your you, your family's got everything scattered out for. <laughs> yeah, Lewis and Andrew are there. They'll be there the rest of the day. So they um they're at Kennesaw Mountain National Battlefield Park, which is um. Five or, five or six miles, I guess, from our house. And uh, we have a large collection of postcards and other memorabilia from the park. So they're there for the day just to to have that on display. They weren't doing any sort of um, presentation or anything like that. They just had all the collection laid out for people to come by and see. So last I heard, they've had about 70 people or so come by. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, I guess it's getting the nice weather time uh, for most of the country. But I, then again, I saw upstate. Harold, did you get a lot of snow in Toronto this week? Actually, none at all. We wow. had a, a bit of sort of drizzly flakes, but nothing that stayed on the ground. But Montreal really got hit. Yeah, because I, I, I all winter long, I've been looking at, uh, uh, you know, webcams and stuff. Up, I, I may have mentioned the town of Long Lake. Love to look at their webcam, and uh, you know, uh, it's a, it's a town I really like to visit when I'm upstate New York. And this winter, it's the lake didn't freeze over; it got ice, but it never froze over. And there's a, another town I forget the name. They had the snowmobile capital of New York, and they have a big pole in the middle of the town. No snow. It's supposed to be a you know a thermometer sort of thing. Well, this week they posted pictures of the Long Lake with 18 inches of snow that came in overnight. I mean, it's snow everywhere. So, uh, you know, it, it, people are saying they had just put away their snowblower unused for the year, and now <laughs> they can't open the garage door to get the snowblower out because it's covered in snow. So we escaped it, luckily. You escaped it. Great. Yeah. How I thought much Montreal... snow did they get up in Montreal? Was my son's up there today. How much snow is up there? Oh, I think it was about a uh, foot and a half or more. And a half. He was, he was trapped in Quebec City. He's trying to make his way back to New Jersey. Okay. <laughs> well it's 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 crazy i mean i remember when i had my college graduation the uh oh, one of my computers is yelling at the hard the hard drive is getting hot it's crunching videos in the background the day before our college graduation we had snow but it was mostly just flurries and stuff but you know that was in may and you go yes that's supposed to have snow in may you know <laughs> the beauties of upstate new york you just never know so um and real quick, before we go, if you are on the East Coast, July 14th, uh, the Queens Theater is going to be uh, showing a, 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 a video of after the fair, uh, uh, basically what about the 64 World Fair in New York State Pavilion about uh, what's been done, you know, how it let to go into ruins, trying to bring it back. And then uh, I will be there at the Queens Theater doing a Q&A about the World's Fair. So uh, it, I think it's uh, July 14th at 3 p.m. And uh, the tickets are supposed to go on sale this week. Uh, it's, they're they're going to be pretty reasonable, $10, I think. But it's, uh, it's a, a good film. And uh, the, the last times we did something, they, they sold out there. And it's also just we're going to have in the lobby of the theater uh, displays of some uh, World's Fair memorabilia and that. The Queen's Theater is doing quite a long program all summer long of uh, uh, events about the fair. Uh, uh, again, they had, in 10 years ago, they commissioned three plays based on the 64 World's Fair that were very critically acclaimed. They're going to be restaging those this September. They're having another day of food from the fair, you know, with people selling waffles and uh, sangria and other odds and ends. So uh, again, if you are interested, if you're anywhere in New York, uh, the Queen's Theater is taking the lead on uh, doing fair-related activities, and they're, they're working with a dance uh, uh, company in Queens uh, to try to do interpretive dance at certain spots of the fair, and they're going to have a QR code you can scan, and then uh, some of my pictures will pop up to show you what it looked like then. But they're doing some stuff that's really interesting. That On Memorial Day, they're going to recreate the Court of the Nations, where they had all the flags of the different nations going down the street. 
where they're getting people from as many nations as they can to march through the uh, park with their own national flag. So somebody from uh, Poland or somebody from Ukraine or you know, some really weird places like New Jersey or whatever, they can all march through. But they're, uh, uh, they're, they're all, uh, it's uh, the, the Parks Department's already crazy. Memorial Day, you want to do this Memorial Day, it's going to be jammed here. And the lady that runs the theater thing says, yeah, we want to do it in the day, but there's actually people there to see it. So, but uh, like I said, if you go to the Queens Theater, not the Queens Museum, but the Queens Theater, sign up on their website or their uh, uh, mailing list, they'll be sending stuff out starting on Monday. Uh, and they're, they're trying to do something basically every weekend throughout the summer to have some World's Fair uh, connection, a scavenger hunt, uh, of various odds and ends. So um, again, I, I encourage people to sign up for that. And I'm looking forward to it. So uh, if any of you folks are in New York, July uh, 14th, uh, come by and say hi. <laughs> so, and then uh, uh, Brock, when is your talk? Uh, the first weekend in uh, May. Okay. Yeah, that I think it's the, the Saturday is the 5th, I believe. The 5th and the 6th are the two days. And there's a reception the night before on Friday. Um, and I just saw the schedule as to when there, you know, different talks are having and different people are involved in the talk. So that's, I've got, I think two on Saturday and one on Sunday, or it might be the other way around. And where is that again for folks that might be interested? Uh, it's going to actually be in, um, celebration right you know down from walt disney world uh that little that community that was uh, set up on disney property um and i think it's at the hotel there's a little hotel we're staying at i haven't gotten all that information yet you know from them uh i mean i just know i'm staying at that hotel and i think somebody said that's where it's where it's going to be but that's going to be in florida it's a walt disney world group you know the uh uh what is it uh Walt Disney World Today uh, thing that this guy runs, you know, uh, he does talks and I mean, presentations and it's a whole society kind of group. Right. And it's, uh, it's also going to be streamed. Uh, you can buy a, a ticket, I believe, to, to see it online, correct? That's what I understand. Yeah, that you can uh, buy tickets. If you go online, I, I haven't gone into the ticket section since I don't have to buy one, but I probably should just to see what it what it's involved in it. And uh, so maybe I'll have more information in two weeks for you on, on that part of it. Yeah, Beth just put something in the chat. Oh, let me see, I did okay. the chat. Let's see what I missed today. Uh, and if you do have stuff you wanna send out, uh, please uh, let me know and we can uh, you know send it out to the folks. Yes, I know I'm okay. chatting with the guest, okay. Uh, <laughs> so Tom, uh, Tom's been to Rochester, Geneva, Finger Lakes, Ithaca, yeah. It, it, it's pretty up there. I, you know, getting out of the city is uh, what you call it, a, a, a big thing. Uh, you know, again, people think about uh, New York and they think about Manhattan. Boy, there's a lot more of it uh, other than that. It's uh, our, our uh, relatives from uh, Binghamton was they were just out here for uh, a, a family thing. So it was good to see them. And so yeah. when we go visit over there, we would that's when we went to the Finger Lakes and like. Lake George, Lake George, and Lake outside Lake of yeah, outside Niagara. of New York State with uh, the the Amish country in, in Pennsylvania and Scranton, and then we also went to Cornell and all those beautiful places in uh, Saratoga Corning. Springs. I was uh, sorry, yeah, Corning, yeah. I was just going to ask you went to Corning. Isn't isn't that a great spot to go and visit? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Corning it's glass a beautiful factory. place. Yeah. To your point, there are many many beautiful places around uh, yeah. New York State. Yeah. 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 Uh, Carol knows all too well my fascination with Lake George. So, uh, you know, uh, again, I, 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 it's, if I had money, it, what, uh, tonight, by the way, I'm going to win. I bought the winning lottery tickets. I got them right here. So when I'm not here, <laughs> but I'm broadcasting with Lake George behind me, you'll know I won and I bought my house in Lake George. <laughs> Hey, you can dream. I mean, the, the other day I won $16 on the lottery, right? You know, I, I spent 20 to get 16 but it was getting closer. So. <laughs> That's great. You said you're going to put it all in the Boy Scout camp, remember? I know. I, I tell you, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if I win the lottery, the Boy Scouts are going to be very happy. So <laughs> uh, they'll probably have to bury me there because I'll have a heart attack if I win. So 
<laughs> and I think I will pay somebody else to come and restore all my slides, restore all my movies, and wash all of Carol's dishes. So, we'll <laughs> yeah, they have to have your priorities, right? So, but uh, again, we'll see folks in two weeks, and I hope uh, uh, Donna. Three, three, weeks. Uh, three weeks. Three weeks. Three What's weeks. That? Three weeks. Well, three weeks. Yeah, yeah, three weeks. Right. I couldn't have made it next Saturday anyway. <laughs> right. Well, I hope, Don, you get to see uh, some of the uh, e Eclipse. We've got all the equipment set up. If, if it happens, we're ready. Got a telescope for photographing it, binoculars for viewing it, and all sorts of special stuff. But, you know, have to keep our fingers crossed. Well, as I said, I'm on patrol. So I think as it starts, I'm going to pull to the side of the road and just get out of the way. Because <laughs> I know there's people going to be driving along. Oh, look at that. And then they're going to be staring into the sun, of course. So Of course, uh, yes. But uh, it, it should be interesting. You know, I, it, I just hope uh, it, there, there's so many people that uh, like uh, uh, Carolyn Peterson, they, they are on cruises to go see this. And you hope that they're going to be in some spot where the, you know. Oh, the, right. So, you know, um, you know, because and there it's 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 just so it, uh, hit and miss with some of this stuff. But I do know, uh, looking upstate, uh, um, you know, some of the hotel prices and everything, people are going to pay a fortune to sit in the clouds. So, yeah. well, real quick, speaking uh, before I made a joke about New Jersey, I I saw uh, this fellow <laughs> that I is going upstate uh, to to look at uh, the eclipse. He's all the way up from Florida. And uh, he's then going to go to something back down in Manhattan. But he posted today about why am I not allowed to post uh, pump my own gas because I'm in, in, in New Jersey. And Joey Vento posted because it's New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> For folks that can't relate, if you, you you pull into a gas station in New York, yeah. uh, New Jersey, rather, and you get out to go pump gas, they'll come flying out at you like, you know, you're taking my job away. You can't do that. So you can the no self service gas in New Jersey. It's just one of those things that makes New Jersey New Jersey. So. Yeah, I'm from New Jersey. The reason they do that, they can't trust you to pump gas without smoking a cigarette. <laughs> I'm afraid you'll blow up everybody. <laughs> it, it was that way in Oregon too, up until recently. Yeah. How was it? Yeah. 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 Um, they yeah. arrest you. <laughs> um, how is sharing the screen work? I just click fine. on uh, if you have something. No, I mean, as far as if I have something, I have a picture that I took at the last eclipse of just when it was going, just before it went total, which they call the diamond ring effect. Okay, um, so here, I'm going to make so, you a co-host. And what do, what do I do? I have it on my computer here. I have it. Right. Do I bring so, that screen up? Yeah, so bring that up on your computer. And then down at the bottom of the Zoom screen, you'll see a, a little uh, green square that says share screen. Okay, well, it's up on my computer, but now I can't see the Zoom screen. Let me do okay, this. Okay, so go I'll to make the it Zoom smaller. Screen. There we go. There is the share click, screen. And then look for the application. Yeah, the open there it is. And click okay. share screen. Share. There you go. Is that? Can oh you see yeah, that? look at that. Very nice. And okay. those little those little orange things over on the sides here, those were actually flames. This wasn't that good in the focus. I had a hard time getting the camera. The, the new cameras don't have an automatic, you know, infinity focus on them and, and you have to play around to get it, but it still kind of showed the effect, what they call the diamond ring effect, where you it's have a just picture the sun's... Of the, total, the total eclipse? After uh, this? I do. Let me see if I can... <laughs> where was uh, that this... taken at, Rob? That was in Oregon, uh, near just uh, south of um, the Portland area. Yeah, I got an a hour shot of the now. cloud going over mine. Yeah, well, no, we we had a clear clear day for it. I'm trying to see if I can. Where is it? Here we go. Bring up the well. Just show them a black square. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, oh, here we go. Here's a little arrow. Maybe there we go. There's there's getting closer to total. Oh yeah. There, there you go. There we're into total there, and you can see the. It's not. I apologize that it's not that highly. Let's see. You're going through them, and there there That's we the are. Corona. With, That's the, with corona. the corona. Yep. And there's coming back the other way now. Well, so, Rock, what kind of camera were you using? I was using a Canon uh, SLR. Uh, Canon, I'm trying to think what model it was. T, T, oh, that's okay. T5, I think. Um, yeah. And the, it doesn't go automatically. You know, the old cameras used to, if you just crank the lens all the way out, it was at infinity. 
This one, no, you can just keep turning it and turning it. And so you have to, I had to find something way, way far away, focus on it, and then come back and, and swing over. That, yep. Yeah, swing yep. over. So that was kind of a. So you're saying thing, lens but... goes to infinity and beyond. <laughs> yes, there you go. Yes, yes. It must be a Disney lens. <laughs> oh, it, yeah. was it the life changing experience everybody talks about? Uh, it was. I mean, I really seriously was considering I've got some relatives that live in Texas that are going to be right under it. Um, and I was thinking about going out there, but there's too many things happening around the same time that I've got to be. Uh, it's just like, no, that'll be too too rushed. I don't want to do that. But it was I'd love to see it again and just experience. And I spent a lot of time trying to take the photographs, but also trying to experience it. They say the best thing to do is if it's your first one, just enjoy it. Watch it. Maybe try to take a couple of photographs, but you spend so much time trying to get everything set up and, and working right that, you know, you, you don't get a chance to enjoy it, but it's pretty unique experience. So anyway. Yeah. They, they say a lot of, just let the experts do it and <laughs> enjoy it. You know, the, yeah. the moon is gradually moving away from the earth. So as it gets smaller in the, in the distant future, there won't be any more total eclipses. Yeah, there will in 20 years. In 20 years, we're talking about tens of thousands of years from now. Well, no, the don't, next we don't have to worry about that. No, no probably so how do, not. How do I unshare this now? Do I just... Uh, the next one that they oh. forecast is 20 years from now. Oh, yeah. But Carol, what Irv's talking about is the moon is going to be... I know. So much closer. Okay. okay. All right. I don't be, think they're... I think it'll cover, it'll still yeah. cover. <laughs> yeah, 20 years it will. 200 years the Earth, It'll be too small to block out all the sun. Right now, it's exactly the same size. I know, but I don't think it's going to make that much difference. Otherwise, they would tell you that. No, it's only moving well, away. Not, not in our lifetime, it won't. That's so true. It doesn't matter. It. it doesn't matter <laughs> yeah. to us. Right. So all you'll right. get are annual er eclipses. So <laughs> All I know is when I win the lottery, I'm going to finish my time machine. I'm going to go and check to see if Ur's right or Carol's right. My, my <laughs> vote has got to be on Carol. Oh, yeah. Just kidding. No. It's not my forecast. It's what I've read. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think it's pretty amazing they can calculate exactly when and where the eclipse is going to be years from now. That's quite an accomplishment to do that. They're actually having a debate about yeah. this particular one, though, of uh, how accurately NASA said here's where it's going to be, and some other scientists said no, it's going to be a little bit smaller uh, uh, window than NASA said. So. You know that if you're on the edge and they're saying you know it could be the difference of a mile or something which I, to me <laughs> who the hell cares for a mile but uh, yeah it's it's pretty pretty amazing that you can predict the you know 200 years well i i still find it amazing to think what it takes to put a satellite on uh, or a man on the moon that you know mm -hmm. to me you know we're at florida cape kennedy there's a moon you shoot straight up no You've got to figure out where you're going to be, where the moon's going to be, and everything else. And I mean, that's incredibly celestial navigation stuff is just insane to me on how they have to figure that out. And that's what I had to do when I worked you know, on the submarines is that when we launched a missile, you had to, you know, figure out where you were. Trajectory. You know where the, yeah, you know where the other city is going to be. But if you're using the North Star as your, uh, you know, uh, guiding thing, you have to start figuring all that out. So it, uh, there was a whole, uh, Whole, whole big uh, department that did that, that they figured out what the numbers were. I just had to put in the computer and make them work. You know, I'm surprised. I haven't heard anybody talk about the, the book. Remember, uh, was it Mark Twain that wrote A Connecticut Yankee, Yankee in yeah. Arthur's Court? Yeah. yeah. And that, yeah. They, that they were able to, uh, you know, forecast the whole event. Yeah. Don't forget the Mayans and the Druids. They seem to be able to predict mm -hmm. some of these things too with some of the stuff that's around. Wow. I didn't, I didn't know you did submarine duty, Bill. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was a, a designer on the Polaris Poseidon Trident submarines. A so, designer? You weren't in the active Navy as a crew member? No, I was a civilian. So uh, we, we had the fun job, though, of taking them out for their test dives before the Navy would take a, a official acceptance of them. So we would uh, build them, and then uh, um, we had the, when I got there, we had the Polaris and the uh, Poseidon uh, boats, and then we were just going into the Trident class. So I wrote the computer operating system for the launch control computer for the Trident submarines. So, uh, and Carol can tell you, we were in England. We went to the uh, Royal Navy Submarine Museum, 
And I just, you know, she said, you know, what's going on? You look, you know, shocked. And I said, there was stuff I designed that's on display in a museum. If there's ever a time you want to feel, <laughs> that's, that's the way you can do it. But it, it was so secret when I did it, I couldn't even tell my family what I did for a living. And now kids are sitting there pushing buttons on it. It was like, wow. It, it was, it was, I all of a sudden felt ancient. So, uh, but is yeah. Your uh, the exhibit, is your name in the exhibit any place? No, 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 no. Uh, Could have added it. <laughs> yeah, but, well, I don't know. Next time Take I go a Sharpie back, marker bring, and sign it. I was going to say, next console. time I go back, I'll bring a Sharpie with me. It will be on. But uh, no, I actually, that's how I ended up being at Disney. We had a, a, a day where we had a launch that didn't we couldn't do. So everybody went over to Disney to play golf. And I went over just for something to do. And it was like the World's Fair again. Uh, so I applied for a job programming the country bears and all that sort of stuff. And then they said, well, you got this whole computer security background and top secret clearance and everything. So I set up Disney's computer security for them. So, uh, you know, my college got a real kick on how do you go from being an electrical engineer on submarines to being a vice president in a movie studio. So it was, uh, you know, you anybody that tries to figure out their trajectory, mine was just, you know, all over the place. So now what I do, I drive around and tow away RVs, so it's <laughs> my life just keeps changing. Yeah, you've had an amazing life. I, I've been very, very lucky. Uh, I, I was the right spot at the right time at very many places, and uh, things worked out uh, really, really well. So I, 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 I am a very, very happy, grateful person for my, my lot in life. And that's why things like the Boy Scout camp big part of my life glad to keep working back on it stuff like that so i'm a big believer in you know paying it paying it forward so we'll see people in three weeks not two not three i got that wrong so we'll see you in three weeks and uh uh in the meantime i'll be sitting there with my map pointing out my july 14th trip to new york and how many waterfalls i can go see so <laughs> see you then and i uh, hope everybody enjoys the eclipse Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Thanks again. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.